Hi YouTube and welcome back. In today's episode of a Hot Seat, we are chatting with one and only Mr. Steven Burns, a best-selling author, stock trader, trading mentor, and overall a pretty cool guy. So let's go. So hi Steve and welcome to uh, first episode of Hot Seat. Uh, recently, I re decided to rebrand the entire channel and call it the hot seat, basically chat with traders. And I, I appreciate you coming over. It's actually my honor having you live and doing this interview with you. Uh, and as most of my interviews are hot, seat, hot seats are mo more like chats, I would like this one to be as well. However, we did prepare some of the questions for you, for you, and by we, I mean me and my subscribers, and I hope you'll be able to answer them and help as many people we, we can. So to start, tell us a little bit about yourself. I did, did, I did an intro, how popular you are um, as you're coming from a stock, stock trading history, right? And I'm, I started learning Forex trading and I'm a technical trader. What kind of trader are you? When did you start? Uh, why did you start? What did trading allow you? You know, a little bit short story about yourself from your, from your perspective. Yeah, I, I really got interested in uh, initially how capital grows through compounding at a very young age. I was probably 16 or 17. I've always had a passion for math. And uh, I, I knew if I got some capital at a young age and I was able to compound it and grow it, it could really uh, grow dramatically. But the key was starting young. So I started uh, uh, my first uh, investment started when I was about 19 years old. And uh, I started in tech stocks. And, you know, I've, I've evolved from initially – tech mutual funds and uh, inside of retirement accounts and then uh, evolving into more activity and trend following and, and swing trading. And, you know, my first great experience was trading the 90s through the tech bubble, you know, and just doing ridiculously well, better than I deserved. A lot of it was just the uh, <laughs> luck of being a being being a sort of like I feel like a lot of people I watch nowadays with the crypto and stuff where they don't realize that they're just in the right place at the right time doing the right thing and they happen to be doing doing that thing but you know you know buying and buying in and leveraging in tech stocks was a great strategy in the 90s with very little blips until March of 2000 you know and you know with my with my little bit of experience I had in what I was doing I had enough money in my my first uh, investment account to pay off my house had I chosen to in the year 2000. So uh, that's a wow. great be beginner's luck, you know, <laughs> if that's, you yeah. know, not knowing what you're doing and, and achieving, you know, what could I do when I learn something? So, of course, at the height of my my ego, uh, I learned that uh, tech stocks don't always go up and uh, started evolving into swing trading and, and, and was not fortunate and ended up having a 50 percent drawdown from my equity peak in March of 2000 uh, into the uh, late 2002, early 2003 lows. And that's when I really learned the risk management, exit strategies, uh, trading with a trend, uh, learning uh, what exactly am I doing. And I was able to come back and I posted some great gains again for another great winning streak from 2003 to 2007. I averaged about 20% returns a year, which is you know great in the stock market world. And uh, with some of my analytics, I was able to uh, sidestep the 2008 meltdown in my primary investment account by going to cash. So I had, I was up, I think 4% in 2008, which is, <laughs> is good for some people that were blowing up. So, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, then I took a pause in 2008 and did a lot of systems testings and analysis. So I came back really, uh, started coming back in March of 2009 and, and, uh, having some great years after that, uh, but some really great runs with the nineties and the 2003 to 2007. And then some really great years. I mean, some flat years with 2000, uh, 15, 2011, not the st same streak, but overall still great compounding of money. And uh, finally uh, being really financially independent and trading full time and uh, sort of retired, but I still trade full time and I still uh, run my website. Well, wait, wait, wait. so a lot of questions that I didn't even plan came from, uh, out of your first answer to my first question. So. Did I did I understood you correctly? You said that you immediately started trading, or you were like uh, experiment, you know, experimenting with the investing. So when did you? I mean, you 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 keep mentioning trading, 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 but uh, at the early age of nineteen, did you actually know how to trade, or you were no. just you know got lucky and you were putting money in the stocks and yeah. stocks were naturally going up? Yeah. 
yeah, I was, yeah, the nineties was more of an, more of an investing strategy of knowing if I put money uh-huh, for, for uh-huh. the principle of the bottom line of the stock market, you know, you put money into companies and you benefit from capitalism and the growth of the company. So yeah, I right. did start, start as investing in the stock market. And I was, and I thought tech is what grows. Tech is what increases earnings is what innovates. So that's where I was really drawn to at the beginning. And still to this day, I still am drawn to the, uh, the best best growth companies of tech along with you know I've done a lot of index trading is what I do now with leveraging of a uh, stock market index because yeah uh-huh. ETFs double double leverage ETFs with some size and uh, you know because in the stock market unlike forex stock market does operate in trends and bull markets and bear markets and uh, and the bull markets you know buy and hold investors you know make money over the long term for 10 year period so if you can capture those those bull market runs with leverage and the right stocks, and a lot of the alpha comes from just a handful of stocks. So, you know, that's how stock market yeah. traders can really make money is being in the right place uh, long. You know, long is generally the best way to make money in the stock market. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, have... naturally, most of the stocks naturally goes long. While in Forex, you're not the, – the Forex market tends to, what, era trend 20, 30 percent of time. The rest is just sideways movement. So while I'm not, I don't know anything about trading stocks. I don't want to uh, say any any advice because that would be good. But from what I read is that uh, stocks do trend longer than the forex trades. Yeah, over the long term, I mean, it's the same thing with stocks. You know, we go sideways for uh, we don't trend. We trend less time than we go. We go sideways for a percentage of time. We trend less. We trend less than we go sideways or or uh, down. So it does, it does fluctuate, oh, yeah? but over the long term is, you know, the long term, if you're bullish and you buy dips and you trade the long side of trends over the long term, that is an edge in trading. And that's what a lot of buy and hold investors benefit from the stock market. If they buy indexes because indexes over the long term, they switch out the stocks. So you get different leading stocks. You know, you're not going to have the same Dow Dow stocks in the Dow as you had a hundred years ago. They're going to take out the losers, put in the winners, the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the SP 500 are systems within themselves that rotate out losers and rotate in winners. So that's why the stock market goes up over the long term with indexes because you have new stocks. And in really the U.S., the U.S. stock market it isn't as profound in other markets around the world, but the U.S. stock market has innovative companies that continue to uh, to rise up and become leaders while the other ones die off. So. If you're in the right stocks, you make a lot of money. And if you're in the indexes of the long term, leverage long, you can make a lot of money. Right. And you, you did mention, uh, you, correct me if I understood you wrong, uh, the part of that a lot of people right now are investing and buying or, you know, get, being lucky with crypto. So you think <laughs> the crypto will be a next, next big, big thing like tech was and at the time when you were young? Younger, I think, sorry. I don't, yeah, yeah. I uh, no, I completely do not think it was. I thought it was. It, it is, and it is statistically the biggest financial bubble in history. Uh, almost every crypto is down over ninety percent right now. Yeah, it's not, what, yeah, it's not yeah. what I. Yeah, it's not what I believe. It's just what has happened. I mean, everybody. You know, people would have had to buy in when it was no reason to buy it. It was ridiculous, and then they would have been. They would have benefited <clears throat> from their bad decision with their uh, mm. crypto long, and then they were thought they were geniuses, and then it pulls back 90% on them. So, you know, unless you have a price action system, I do not understand how people can just buy and hold crypto. Buy and hold stocks is historically a beneficial system over 100, 100 plus years in the U.S. Buy and hold crypto is a brand new thing. We don't even know which ones are going to be accepted as actual exchange. And, and another thing, like you know, Forex is not an investment. Forexes are playing yep. the differences of, of value compared to different for- – different uh, currencies and currency pairs your long one short another uh crypto crypt, a, a currency is not an investment a currency is something you use for transactions and it's a utility and then the crypto traders you know think the u.s dollar is worthless and it's not backed by gold or not backed by anything it, it's backed by the u.s military and the u.s government that's what yeah. backs the u.s but dollar, the problem so. is that the u.s people will <laughs> Uh, yeah. will return its, its tax uh, obligations. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's it's legal currency in the United States and in the world, you know, the, the strength of the dollar versus everything else, you know. and the, Yeah, the, the every currency is backed by the United States. <laughs> yeah, so I don't, I mean, they're, they're just making huge errors, and I can see it. I mean, uh, just like the, like, similar, like you said, a lot of the dot-com companies were worthless. They're not going to, they didn't make any money. They weren't going to make any money. 
and they won't have any earnings, so they're never going to be worth anything. And uh, crypto is not even a company. It's not even the right asset class. Yeah, it's not even the investment. It, it cannot make <laughs> money. It's just things that moves around. It's not. <laughs> yeah, it just it's nothing. It's thin air. But to be uh, fair, I do hold some of the cryptos. Do you? No. If if uh, no, I did, I did nothing. No, nothing. I did open a Coinbase. I, I did download the Coinbase app and and had it loaded to try to see if there was one that was going to emerge as a winner. Because uh, on the other side of that, like PayPal emerged as a real internet internet payment system. I mean, one yeah. crypto will likely emerge as an internet currency. Now, how that's valued based on uh, – it's not something to trade with. It's something that's going to be valued based on its utility and what people think it's worth, not a bubble. A bubble is when somebody just thinks something's worth something it's not. And when Bitcoin goes from 18 or 19, almost 20000 back to 3000 yeah. that showed that it was an incorrect pricing. Yep, and now it's oh, – well, we'll see what's going to happen. You know, A lot of people – yeah, we will we will see. Adam, I'm still uh, on break even point. I, I have nothing to lose, so I'll just hold it. It's not a lot of money though, so it, right. it, it will be fine. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, that's why I'm, I didn't decide to put all of my uh, <laughs> money and in, in crypto. I rather uh, learn a skill of trading, uh, at least yes. forex. I'm yeah. st still learning though. I, I think you never stop learning, but you no. know, I think that you can make. Uh, significantly more money with trading stocks or forex than in by investing in crypto, because uh, th there is a skill to learn. And with crypto, I don't know. Besides trading, if you have a technical system, just like you said, uh, I don't think it, it will be. You have a stomach to go through this volatility <laughs> and everything that's going on in the crypto yes. world. At least yeah, for holding. the average person. Yes. Yeah, holding power through the madness, which is not, it's not a historical mandated evaluation. You can't even, you know, backtest the, it's just use the, there's not enough data on it yet, which, which yeah, one yeah, could, exactly. one, yeah. one could emerge. You know, we will, I mean, I would not be surprised if one emerges that's actually a good utility for transactions. I don't think Bitcoin is that one. No, me neither. I've seen a lot of examples and a lot of uh, real life usage of actually Ripple. So we will, but that's a, yes. again, yep. you have, yeah. So you know that's the same I'm thing I've heard. I had the, that's the same one I heard. I thought that had the best utility potential. Yep. Yeah. But we will see again. Yes. The crypto yep. stands for anonymity that mm -hmm. uh, everybody, you know, a free world and all of that stuff. And then XRP, the ripple is controlled mm -hmm. by banks. And uh, we will see what's yeah. going to happen. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Let, let the market decide. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Now let, let us get back to the to the team <laughs> of this hot seat. <laughs> so you started back at ninety one when you uh, what? Am I correctly nineteen ninety one? Yeah, yes. when you were nineteen years old, you started trading, investing. Then you you kind of merge, you kind of started trading and all that cool mm -hmm. stuff. Uh, so. Uh, how, how did you start, you know, learning to trade? You you got lucky. You made a lot of money. So what what was your move forward? You know, okay, man, you were lucky. Now you got to yeah. learn how to trade. <laughs> so what what what? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The the taste of success. You know, once you have that level of taste of success, which I know so many people that way that just had the the big giant wins over long periods of time, or even one big year where they never lose that taste of doing it. So. So I learned, you know, I knew that I had to have processes in place to lock in profits. I, had I had a better process during that, you know, who knows what I could have done, you know, doing the uh, doing as well as I did, you know, just with some basic principles, which were valid at the time and they did work, but like didn't have the exit strategy, which, you know, most buy and hold investors also don't have an exit strategy. So I started reading every trading book I could find. I read uh, uh, up from a. Uh, the early 2000s on, I read hundreds and hundreds. I think I ended up reading over 400 trading and investing books. Because I figured if I could, about 400. I've reviewed most of them on Amazon.com. Because I actually started reviewing wow. them on Amazon.com because I wanted to have a book report for myself to capture the principles that I was learning. So, uh, ah, so the hundreds, I, I mean, and then I ended up connecting with some authors, trading authors who sent me some of their books to review on Amazon. And that's how sort of the whole social media thing started, was actually being the number one uh, trading book reviewer on Amazon.com. Actually, I uh, was 150th most helpful reviewer on all of Amazon.com in the early 2000s. So that, that's that, how you but, started, huh? And that was just something I was doing for myself. I wasn't doing that publicly for anybody to notice. 
So that was interesting how that started. So, so with all the books, and I started learning from, you know, each book, if you can get some good solid knowledge from each book, you know, they can pay you back uh, 10, 20 fold. So, you know, after reading all the books and I started developing back testing strategies, I started doing historical chart studies. I started looking at how to structure trades. I read a bunch of just breakthrough books where I really studied the market wizards. You know, what did Paul Tudor Jones do? What did, uh, what did all these, the, the guys that were the big winners, Ed Sakota, all the guys, even the, the older Nicholas Darvis, I actually studied the traders that made the money and, you know, actually had the results that you could actually see. And what did see. they do? What did they do? They all together had the similarity, even Jesse Livermore. They, they yeah. rode winners. They rode winners. They had, they maximized their wins. And whatever the time frame was, they minimized their losses. They had a quantified process for managing each trade after they entered it. They had entry signals that caused them to enter it. Then they had a process for managing each trade. And the real profitability came across the board from just people having big wins and small losses, even regardless of winning percent. So people don't really – can't wrap their brain around because everybody wants to be right every time. If you have a, uh, I think Paul Tudor Jones said, if you have a one to five risk reward ratio, you can be yeah. wrong 80% of the time and still make money. If you lose yeah. five trades, you lose 100 bucks, lose 100 bucks, lose 100 bucks, lose 100 bucks, make 500 on the fifth trade, you actually made 100 bucks. And most people cannot wrap yeah. their brains around that. Well, it's hard because, uh, yeah, well, it's hard to realize a lot of people do, don't like losing and they think that the losing should not be a part of their trading system. But, uh, I don't think that's even doable and possible. When I was first starting out, I was obviously naturally, I was naturally thinking you got to win 95% of the time rather than, you know, lose, win, lose, win, lose, lose, win, lose, win, and then yeah. Uh, yeah. make winners bigger than losers. But mm -hmm. after I met Akil and T1 trading, uh, that changed. That changed drastically. Uh, the, the thing is that now when I, this is, Steve, like my second week of trading live with small account, mm -hmm. like 2000 euros, nothing much, but mm -hmm. this, this mm -hmm. is my actually third year or four year in trading for the past two years. I was struggling. Then I met Akil and Jason, and then I changed everything. The only focus I had right have right now in, in my trading is follow the rules. Yep. That's it. Nothing else. Yep. I, and the, the thing that I like, I know that I should be interviewing you, but what I like to preach <laughs> is, <laughs> Uh, is, is, is the, that, uh, I, I, I don't even like to spend time in front of my charts. I see the opportunity, I mark them up and I leave mm -hmm. the trade. What's going to happen? It will happen. I don't care for it. Mm -hmm. At least I'm trying to, you know, to adopt that, uh, thinking. Yeah, that is exactly the process that I recommend as well as a first step. So you, you, you did it when you said you were studying the, the big dogs. Uh, you were going through a bunch of books, 400 books and more. And uh, so, and I saw your post on the Twitter, I believe, or on Facebook, I don't know, Instagram. You, you did a back testing uh, of uh, some kind of an ETF, I think, or an index mm -hmm. fund. I, I don't yes. know. And over 80, 60, 60 trades or so over the time period, I don't know. So is the process of back testing the same thing that we that Akil and Jason teaches us in within the tier one trading platform. Yeah. I, Is it the I, same thing? Follow your rules and just, you know, believe it, it will happen again and again and again and again. Well, the, the first step, you know, the trading rules, like you said, writing a trading plan, following it, having rules to execute to create good asymmetric trades, you know, that is the second, that's the first step in the process of live trading. But the homework of that is actually going back to what happened. You know, if you go back and back test, if I buy the breakout of Forex in the first hour of the trading time of my time zone, or if you break it by time zones and go, if I bought this breakout and I targeted it to go to here, and I use this trailing stop, how would that work out? And go back and see how that worked out over enough uh, samples to see if it has meaning. Is actually seeing if what you're doing works is what back testing is. That's what you, the homework you do before your trading plan. Is, okay, uh, and what would be enough samples in stocks? Uh, so, like, you would do this. Say, buy and hold investors in the SP 500. If they want to know what would happen if I uh, if I use a 200 day moving average in spy, and if the if it closed at the end of the month under the 200 day in spy, I would just go to cash. If it was above the 200 day in spy, the price was over the 200 day in the last day of the month. If I went back long, yep. what would happen? And then you just back test that to software and say the 2000 to 2019. And you might see that it returned uh, almost 400% in that time period, as an example. And buy and hold, if you just bought held spy, it only returned like 140%.
and then the drawdown, uh-huh. in the, and it might be 20% drawdown in the 200-day moving average system, and it might be, you know, a 55% drawdown in the SPY. <laughs> so you're like, well, crap, I would that that worked better historically in the 21st century than just buying and holding. So why am I holding through these bear markets? That would be a signal telling me to get out. So that's just a basic example to get people started in a different thought process. Yeah. So you, when okay. I got you. I got you. So, some you set up set up set of rules, and then you see what what it did historically by following strictly those rules. And what would be sample big enough, or you don't care for a sample? Because when I'm backtesting forex trade, I need at least hundred trades mm-hmm. or five years worth of data mm-hmm. data. And uh, in, uh, you know, you said historically, how far away, how far in history should we go? Should we base yeah, our it, bet testing results based on sample size or in history, like in that many years? Yeah, for me, it depends. Everybody's different. You know, a day trader would just want to tra- day one, one, like you said, maybe 100 tests through volatility, uh, sideways markets, uptrends, downtrends. You want to have different market environments because the reason everybody thinks that everybody can just win every trade all the time, people that have no idea what they're talking about, is you can't win every trade and win all the time because the markets change. There are black swan events where something crazy. That's another good thing to back test. You know, if you want to. Like you think selling put options on the S and P 500 index is the holy grail, and you make money over 90 uh, some percent of the time. Back test, see how it would have done during the Black Monday of 1987 or the uh-huh. uh, 2008 <laughs> crash, because you might find you have a great system and it blows up suddenly, and you lose all the money you've ever made, uh, depending on what the the system is if it's uh, open risk. But you, you know, for me, you know, I like to test through at least the the the, the whole 21st century from the year 2000 to 2019 because that gives me the financial crisis that gives me the dot com bubble burst that gives me sideways years it gives me the flash crash you know it gives me yeah, a lot of bigger different historical invi- events yeah, yeah I, I, well, what is, yeah you might like you have the holy grail during a bull market run for seven years but you might it might uh, be a disaster and give back all the money which is what i found a lot in short selling on uh, the stock market indexes you know, a lot of uh, short systems, people want to short stocks. They always say, why can't you just make money shorting? It's so easy. But if you back test that, even the money you would have made uh, during the 2008 or the, the dot-com bust, you get chopped to death all the other nine. You might get chopped up for nine years, you know, and you make some few small wins and then make a big win in the in the real plunges in the stock market. But then you lose all the false entries, make you lose so many little losses that it isn't worth it. And that's something that you can discover through back testing. Right. Okay. So, b- back to a few of the questions, though. What What was your biggest aha moment in your trading career? You know, when did you realize what was what was the moment that changed the course of your career? Hmm. Well, that's a good question. Somewhere in the early two thousands, I think uh, trend following by Michael Covell, where he goes back and he actually. Uh, did endless research into quantitative data on all the trend followers that one of them, I think it was John W. Henry owns the Boston Red Sox and was on the right uh-huh. side of, of market crash. I think he was on the right side of a, it might've been LTCM. I don't remember specifically, but uh, you know, the guys that made the really big money and, and Covell in his book, he says uh, trend followers are traders that use uh, reactive technical analysis to do to follow uh, something like to follow what the market is doing, not trying to predict what's going to do, and you know just the understanding to re- reverse to reactive trading versus predictive trading, reactive uh, technical analysis based on your own signals versus predictive predictive technical analysis based on a pattern and the way you think it's going to play out. That was okay, really so you, a big game changer for me. So you became became more reactive than the predictive trader. Yeah, following the actual what was going on, always getting that open mind to what is actually going on here, not what I think should go on, not what I think has to go on, but what is actually uh, so happening. So it's a completely different approach, yeah. Oh, that's mm-hmm. why a lot of people are trading. You, you always need to be able to change your mind immediately. Yep. Does Absolutely. the same thing apply to Forex? Yeah, it's, it's the same trading. I think the trading principles are the same across all markets. I mean, there's different – everything else is details. But the, the, the path to profitable trading is the same principles. You either have to have big wins and small losses, or you have to have a high, high winning percent and small losses uh, to be profitable. I don't think it the, – the dynamics of profitability doesn't change. It's just the different details and what gets you there across all markets. Okay. 
So you've had a rich, rich trading career and investing career. Are, do you still have an exposure to the stock market in terms of the investment, not, not mm-hmm. in terms of trading? Because you did say that you're still trading daily, yeah? Yes. Yeah, I still have a large account that I trade uh, daily. Large. I still, yeah, I have enough to, that I don't have to worry about paying the light bill regardless of results. I sort of I don't have to worry about, you know, making money every day. I mean, I pretty much uh, have had the good year, had a good run, I had to have the money, but I still trade my account. I'm not as aggressive as I used to be because now I just have to keep what I have and maintain it and grow it. I don't have to press to, to grow a large account. I have large accounts now. So, yes, but I still do actively trade. I put my trades in my uh, my live Twitter. I have a private Twitter group with my um, yep. students that I post my trades live daily. Okay, Steve, tell us, what are you doing right now on a daily basis? What what do you do? Uh, I have end-of-day signals where I take positions based on if my signals have executed or not. I have crossover signals, moving average signals, and then I buy and sell based on the price action. So I really spend a, about 30 to 45 minutes a day at the end of the close of the stock market seeing what I should enter and exit. So that's everything you do on a daily basis in regards to trading? You just check out? daily signal and that, that's yep. kind of it and that and that's and if that shocks people because they want to have all the screens up and all the and spend eight nine hours a day trading if you do that you have to consider how much money you have to make to justify that much time spent trading but uh yeah and a lot of legends if you research ed sakota uh tom yeah. basso nicholas darvis a lot of uh, legends actually used end of day trading because they they made money in their big trends and big positions that they wrote for money not trying to scalp a few dollars and pennies here and there. Yeah, they help to it. Well, there is also one one cool swing strategy that people are at tier one are teaching us as well. Basically, at the end of the day, you have your I don't know, Excel spreadsheet and something. You just mark check marks, and when every every condition is met, you take a position. That's it. That's not and a very good you, process. You, yeah, swing trading produces if if you backtest it, you know over uh, a bigger amount of pairs produces around 35 or 40 it depends on everything you do you know but yeah okay so your trading is basically boring so it's not a <laughs> lot of movement <laughs> yeah and that's the funniest thing is the, the the years i made the most money was all based on uh, just holding some big winning trades and stocks and trends and just looking and going oh that's great apple's up huge this morning oh that's amazing uh, price line and Apple gapped up or, you know, Amazon's up, you know, just looking, going, oh, that's great. And going about my life, you know, not having to, uh, I mean, I, I did, I mean, I did do my day trading time and I did, I mean, I've experimented with just about every way you can trade the stock market to make money and, you know, option spreads. And I have done a little bit of everything in the stock market, but that has been the one that actually made the money. Okay. That's very cool to know. But you also run, as I said in the intro, you're also running the website called NewTraderU.com. The link will be in the in below this interview in the description part. And you're running NewTraderUniversity.com. So what is the difference between the two? Uh, how's that going? Do you have students? Where, where can people learn from you? Yeah, I actually, uh, it sort of grew. It's strange the journey I've been on before, uh, you know, reviewing the books, trading books on Amazon. They sort of grew into me knowing other authors and then, I got a, a guy published me. I wrote uh, wrote some books early on that a guy published books because I was an expert on the Nicholas Darvis system. So he taught me into publishing a book. And then, you know, I, and then another friend that had a uh, MMA website wanted to build me a website and taught me into building New Trader U, oddly enough. He said I should be blogging. <laughs> and I think, why the heck should I be blogging? So it was really funny that uh, my books and then, you know, my my current wife, uh, she's a web developer and she's the one that you built out. And she actually did e-learning for different tech companies over the years. So she said, hey, you should have some e-courses. And like, you know, I just never – it's funny how it all sort of happened the way it happened. I mean, the, what I've always enjoyed has been Twitter and Facebook and social media. I enjoyed connecting with all the traders and the, the legends around the world and uh, people. I've enjoyed that. But uh, it, the new trader you is the – my blogging platform and the links go from there for all my different social media and for uh, my new trade university is really the online learning platform where you can actually take an e-course in uh, new trader U 101 or options 101 or uh, back testing 101 so I actually go through and created learning resources for the different principles 
that people asked about so much. Okay, so is, is there in any of those courses that you can, uh, that people can get access to you? Like you, you mentioned you have a, some kind of a, uh, a private Twitter or a, what is it, a membership site or a Facebook group where yeah, you share actually, your trade? Yeah, I actually have a, a, new tr um, a technical trading newsletter. And what I do is I actually go through the video. I just go through my chart reviews, which I was doing anyway, you know, after the market, uh, after the market closes, I'll go through my chart reviews again and actually talk about what I see on every chart and what my signals are. And I also have a private Twitter feed set up that's uh, for my newsletter subscribers and people that buy my e-course packages where they can actually go be uh, joined into my private Twitter group. And I put them in message and we just chat and I talk about I'm about to so I just tell them what I'm doing. I'm not recommending any investments. But I'm yeah, just showing yeah, what, yeah, I, what, what I'm doing. I'll say, you know, I'm taking the 10-day, 50-day crossover in the Russell 2000 IWM, and I'll put up a chart. So I just show them what I am doing without recommending anything for them to do. It's all based on their own risk tolerance and return goals. So, yeah, that, of course, yeah. that is something I do. I can chat with them during uh, market hours in the private group. Okay. I have to ask one uh, well, one specific question that I ask uh, uh almost everybody who, who's been teaching online because and some people tend to ask this and well, why teaching people when you're already making a lot of money <laughs> you were expecting it huh? <laughs> yeah there's so many answers to there's so many answers to that you know i hope yeah there's so many i hope people like there's some people on there like if you're seeing lamborghinis and uh and stacks of money you know they're not traders they're just trying to get you to give them their money Marketers. so they can yeah but, you know, with ridiculous amounts of money uh, there's other people that just do it to diversify their income. You know, every trader is a multimillionaire and they just want a different diversified income by adding value. You know, nothing unethical about writing books or, uh, or you know, creating yeah. learning resources. College professors make very good money, <laughs> make a lot more money for teaching people a lot less useful things. But, um, but you know, a lot, most teachers that I know of that do it on the side, they trade and they do that. You know, when, I don't know what else I would do if I'm not doing that and I'm doing end of day signals. I don't know how much TV or movies I could watch or uh, games watch, I could huh? play. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I would do if I don't do that because I have all day, every day. And what I enjoy doing is social media primarily. I don't, uh, that's what I like doing. I mean, I, I enjoy some of the things I create. You know, I enjoy, I'm passionate about it. I read so many books. I got to a point where like, you know, why don't I write some books? And I had some passionately write the new trader, rich trader stories. And uh, so I started sort of reading another 400 books. I actually wrote uh, whatever it is, 15, 16 books. So something for yeah. me to do to stay active, just like, uh, you know, Ray Dalio was a multi-billionaire uh, and he wrote books. So why is Ray Dalio out writing books when he's a billionaire? Because he yeah, wants to why do is it. He? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's yeah, not out yeah. trying to scrounge up money from his books. So, so a lot of different yeah, motivations. Gonna... <laughs> <laughs> Hope. Hopefully, and George Soros, a billionaire, also wrote books. So hopefully, most uh, teachers just do it because they love it, they're passionate about it, and they don't really know what else they would do with their time. Yeah, well, that, that's, that's the good part about trading. Uh, well, when you get good at it, you don't need to spend a lot of time in front of your PC or in front of your, like, multiple screens and, you know, day trading because you can make as, that or even more money. Swing trading and taking a look at the charts hour per day and you have 23 hours to do whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, you, if you're really, really good at trend trading or swing trading, uh, end of day trading, you never even have to day trade because you're already financially independent. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm yet to get there. I'm yet to get there. Uh, but tell me, Steve, so what type of trader are you? You know, Are you a fundamental, technical, a mixture of both? Because in stocks, you might need to be. Uh, tell us a little bit about, about that. I'm almost pure technical trader. I do have some pure parameters, technical. pure okay. technical, reactive technical analysis. I have almost no fundamentals. I will at times look at the fundamentals of a stock to put them on my watch list. You know, if it has the right, uh, you know, like a Google or an Amazon or a, I mean, I missed the Tesla and Amazon runs because the fundamentals were so terribly bad. <laughs> so one of the few times I use fundamentals as a filter, I actually missed uh Two of their biggest uh, trends. I mean, yeah, I mm -hmm. traded some of them, but not not to the extent I could have with the trends that they had. But uh, Apple was the one I did nail in Priceline because of their great fundamentals while they were in trending stages over the last six, seven years. 
Uh, but yeah, fundamentals. Uh, I will use fundamentals only sometimes to create my watch list of stocks. That's about it. All my trading is 100% based on technical uh, signals. Do you create your watch list on stocks every day, every week, every month? No, I review. I review at least weekly. But they they rarely okay. change. Usually the big monster leaders are usually the same, and then they for a new technology or a new business model knocks one out. Uh huh. So that's what you're looking at. Uh, okay. Now there are a few easy questions. Uh, so best trading strategy for you would be a trend following, trend trading. I would say it's trend trading. It's not really trend following because my time frame is not as long as most trend followers. I generally take trades for uh, for uh, maybe maybe days, weeks, or sometimes a couple of months, but that's rare. Usually my trades last for. Um, you know, the 10 days, 14 days is probably a normal time frame for me. For winners, losers usually last about a day or two. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> I think I think that's something. Like, I think that's a key too to, for your listeners is the time you want to spend more. If you spend three times more time in your winners and one third less time in your losers, you can make a, make a lot more profits. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I'm, I'm just not now. I'm, I'm I'm asking also questions that come up to my mind as well. So uh, because it's very interesting, uh, what would you recommend a a newbie trader to start with with forex or stock stocks? I think it all depends on their own personal risk uh, and goals. But I mean that's just my. I mean I know people that trade forex successfully, trade stocks, options, futures, and a lot of futures trader. I've never traded futures. But you know, first you got to start with like, what is their goal? How much are they trying to make? You know, how much are they trying to make every year? And you have to work your, you have to start with your goals and work your way back. You know, how much do I have okay, to Okay, so what trade? would be the easiest way of making <laughs> two hundred grand per year? <laughs> two hundred, have have two million dollars would be your first step to okay, make two hundred grand. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's yeah, that's your yeah, first yeah. step. You have to have the capital. I mean, I mean that's another undercapitalization can really hurt people too because you yeah. the best traders in the world historically make about twenty percent a year. Those are the yeah. best. So people that show their Lamborghinis and they turn two thousand into two hundred thousand in a year is that that's ninety nine point nine nine percent fraud. Yeah, I can agree with you. <laughs> it took me just four years to find that out. <laughs> That's, yeah, yeah it's, that's terrible what, what goes on out there. When, I mean, like I, I, when you understand the statistical data, you know, how hard it is for even hedge fund managers with all the data and all the, the screens and speed, and even they have trouble beating the SP 500. You know, that's something to really be aware of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But a lot of people are not. They see this as get rich quick thingy. And I mean, I, I got into it because I thought, okay, so my friend is doing it. He got, you know, it's not that hard. And then I blew a few accounts. I didn't blew a lot yeah. of money, maybe thousand, two thousand dollars. And then I stopped yeah. and said, "Okay, man, you gotta do this properly. It's not gonna yeah. happen." And now I understand that flipping accounts, getting from one thousand to ten thousand, is near nearly impossible. Impossible unless you're bet, unless you're betting. I mean, unless you're gambling, not betting, gambling. Yes. Yeah, you have to. I mean, there there are some successful lottery level players in trading that they just go big on bets and they either blow up or win and they win sometimes. But that's just not a long term strategy. Much better to have a profitable system where you're just trying to grow your capital and return. But like you said, though, you have to you know depending on what your goals are, you got to be capitalized for it. Uh, of course, of course. Or you can get good, get good, get that uh, proof out there that you're really, really <laughs> good, and then start managing some other other people's money. Yeah, and then eventually what, bid your capital mm -hmm. that way. That's where most people. That's what they don't say. Most people make money in the market. Even the Paul Tudor Jones is a lot of the uh, successful market wizards. You know, they were money managers. They weren't trying to make a living off of ten thousand dollars in trading capital. Yeah, yeah, they were they managing millions and getting their two and twenty. Yeah. So that's that's and, another thing people have to realize. Uh, so. What is what was or what, what was your biggest winner and biggest loser in trading? Not mo oh money wise, if you feel comfortable, or percentage wise. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll do I can do money in that. Uh, the uh, okay. There's a couple. There's been a couple. I mean, I've had a bunch of five five uh, five figure wins. You know, in the stock market, Shit. even with the even with the S and P five, even with the S P five hundred, even with managing risk. I mean. Uh, but I mean, the most exciting one for a good, uh, interview is the, uh, I went long at Apple strangle play. I think it was 2012 
and it was back in Apple was about five hundred dollars a share, and I bought ten wow. con I bought ten contracts. I actually have the blog post on my site. Uh, ten contracts long and ten contracts short. I think it was ten dollars out of the money both directions. So I was controlling about a million dollars in in value of Apple stock for only a few thousand dollars in the options, and uh, and then it gapped down. I didn't know which way it was going to go. I was playing volatility on, and I was I bought the close and I, and. I bought the clothes sure. and then I uh, sold them at the open the next day. So I was only risking the faded decay overnight. And uh, it gapped down, I think it was 20 or $30 a share. And uh, I, from the, I, I bought them at the close and then I sold them at the open. And uh, I think it was uh, five or $6,000 just overnight <laughs> in that one trade. Yeah. That so that was, a, that was a crazy one back, <laughs> back when I, I mean, I was much more aggressive and did much more aggressive things when I was younger. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. And uh, you know, a lot of people tend to do crazier stuff when 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 they're younger. Yeah, if you can, but the thing people have to understand too is, I get older. You know, if you have a two, if, if you have a hundred thousand dollar account, you know, one percent risk. That's what people can't wrap their brain around. You shouldn't lose more than one percent if you're wrong. So yeah. if you're a hundred thousand dollar account and you're trading, you should make three thousand when you're right, and you should lose a thousand when you're wrong. And that's plenty of money. If you can trade well and do it over and over again, you can make you know, a lot of money a month. You don't have to risk your whole account for that pursuit. Yep. Yep. Yeah. But a lot of people also think that when when growing small accounts, you, you can you feel comfortable risking twenty percent because you know yeah. twenty out of the maybe a thousand is nothing. Twenty out of the five thousand, okay, it's something. Twenty percent out of a hundred thousand it's a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah, that's another thing, undercapitalization. I mean, that's just a formula for blow-up, regardless of your account size. You know, if you lose 50% of your account, you have to make 100% to get back to even, regardless yep. of size, and the math works against you. You have to have enough where 1% is a meaningful risk amount because you want to be able to make 3 or 4 or 5% return on your capital. And you can do it over and over and over and compound your account. But if that you go into sm- happens. yeah, and if you go too small and you uh, trade too big, you're not. It's just it's it's virtually impossible. And even the people that got small accounts, they went big, they made it, they built their account, then they end up blowing up because of those risk dynamics. The first losing streak is your last, because <laughs> 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 you're not going to yeah. come back from a fifty percent. You have to double. That is, I've been there twice, and that is the ultimate in brutality to how to come back from being fifty percent down. Yeah, I bet it's hard. I don't wanna. I don't wanna try. <laughs> I don't even wanna try to go through this, through this stuff. So if, you, yeah. if you're risking, you're risking a ten percent per trade, and it only takes five trades in a row losses to uh, to bring you down fifty percent. Yeah, and they do happen in a row. They they tend to happen. I have my best tested system. I have maximum maximum uh, losing streak is six trades in a row. Yeah, very important. Yeah, what was your pers- biggest loser? So you had a big dinner of. Uh, yeah, I remember. Them. <laughs> I remember one morning I had a new uh, system I thought up in. Uh, this was a long time ago, uh, seven maybe seven or eight years ago maybe. Uh, I had a new system and I went. I was going to go short Baidu and uh, crap. What was the other one? It was another really aggressive tech name. Maybe it was Intuitive Surgical. I'm not exactly sure, but. But uh, I went short of the two, and I went way too big a position size. And then, like, the market exploded higher on me, just a ridiculous uh, rally out of nowhere. And I was just too big to even hold it, so I had to exit. It was about a, over $4,000 loss one morning. Oh, wow. So that was, Did you stop that trading? Were... No, I didn't. I, nope, I had to focus on getting it back. <laughs> getting back. That, I, I spent, if I would not spend so much time trying to get back the losses over the years, that's really what stopped me from the big losses. I'm completely happy with small losses and big wins and never having big losses again because of all the uh, clawbacks I had to do. Okay. Which brings us to the kind of the last question. But before we do that, guys, if you like the content so far, if you're 45 minutes in roughly, click the like button. Also, make sure to click that subscribe button. I'm sorry, Steve, I had to do this as every YouTuber would. And <laughs> click that share button, of course. Make sure to check <laughs> yeah. out those description links from Steve. And that brings us to our last question. <laughs> now, it's not the question, it's basically the advice that I asked. So what do you think is the single most important thing in trading, regardless of, are people trying to trade stocks or Forex? Uh, 
Well, oh, that's a good one. Uh-huh. I, <laughs> I got don't, you there. Well, it's, 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 between, <laughs> it's between don't have big losses and uh, do not trade unless you have a quantified edge. Either one of those okay. things. If you're trading randomly, you're never going to make it. Even if you get lucky, then you're going to get unlucky. And if you have big losses, you're not going to make it. It doesn't matter what you do. The first string of big losses, you're going to be back to square one again. So you have to have an right. edge, and you have to manage. You have to keep your losses small. Okay, guys, you heard it all from a guy who wrote numerous. Uh, how many books, man? Over fifty, you said? No, it was sixteen or sixteen or seventeen. Sixteen, sixteen or seventeen Something like books. That. You can check out the Amazon link also down below. Steve, thank you very much again for coming here. I really do appreciate it. Uh, and I hope to hear back from you here. I hope to speak with you soon. Yep, it's been good talking to you, Ivan. Thanks, man.